Uh, let's get into it. I'll uh, just have a very uh, simple message today as well. Uh, we've been talk looking at just um, more practical thing, leadership, and now I'm looking at uh, a bit more on teamwork today. So I don't know whether you're NBA fans, but I am a big NBA fan. And before the NBA season ended, with the LA Lakers being crowned the champion and uh, LeBron winning his you know, fourth championship, third uh, champion with like a different team and all that. So it's like really historical stuff. But you know, my attention is not on the LA Lakers. I want to kind of look at their next door neighbor, that is the LA Clippers, who have failed epically all right, to meet the expectation that everyone had on them being the title favorites this year. And uh, when they lose uh, with one, um, they blew a 3-1 lead in a very uh, amazing fashion. And in their exit interview, one of their superstars, um, that's this guy, Paul George, in his exit interview, he, he doubled down that saying that our season this year is not a championship or bust season. And everyone's just like, well, where did that come from? And uh, so what he was saying was the goal for our team was not to exclusively just to win championship and anything short of a championship means that we have failed entirely. And the moment he said that, the whole NBA world, the analysts, the media, the fans, the Clippers organization, and even his teammates just kind of looked at him and be like, what are you, what are you saying, man? Like, it is a championship or bus season. And when we, when we see that from the sideline, it can, it's quite obvious that this team was not on the same page, that their failure as a team is due to not being on the same page in a very epic fashion. But the thing is, we don't need to look at the NBA so far away to find dysfunctions in a team. Uh, we see dysfunctions all around us. You think about the place of work. Perhaps you already see some dysfunctions going there. Uh, maybe you play social sports, and in your team, you see some dysfunctions there. Or maybe among your friends, uh, within your family, or even in the church, you might see some dysfunctions going on. In fact, one of the most common criticisms about Christians is actually how we often seem to be not on the same page and there's this inability to work together and perhaps the longer you are in church the more you served and uh, worked around with uh, people in church the more you kind of agree to this observation not necessarily in a cynical way but it's just the fact that teamwork is not easy that teamwork takes work as a team for it to work Yet teamwork, or in a more biblical term, co-work, um, is what is expected, actually, of, of Christian. It's kind of something that's built into our spiritual DNA as a body of Christ. I'm just reading from Romans chapter 12, and it says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, that's Paul speaking, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Is there anyone that popped in your mind that you're just like, oh, that guy definitely thinks of himself more highly than he should. If that is the case, you know, just point to that person. Oh, no, no one. Everyone's very humble. <laughs> what are you trying to say, man? And, uh, but rather, think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body. And each member belong to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. See, if you don't know your Bible well, you can even just Google search teamwork in the Bible, and you will find the Bible is not lacking on any teaching about the attitude for successful teamwork even looking at this passage it is talking about be humble assist yourself critically and accurately not to think too low of yourself but definitely not too high sober judgment assist that kind of implies to know and to hone your strengths and be the best you that god has created you to be 
In fact, last year we studied through Ephesians chapter 4 on unity, and we see the characteristic of an attitude for unity, for people to work together, to be together, in fact, is to be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. And we see a lot, quite often in the Bible, it highlights the right attitude to have for unity and for teamwork. And the right attitude is crucial. It is the most important first step. It is like building a solid foundation. It is an important start. But it is a start. It is a first step, which implies there is to be a next step. It is to come to be completed in some way or fashion because it is just a start. It is just a first step. And our right attitudes need to be supported by the right framework. And often as Christians in churches, our teaching may stop with the attitude without going to the supporting framework. So I want to look into that a little bit uh, today and hope that will be helpful for you just in your life in general, but also serving with one another in a church setting or in other places as you collaborate with other Christians as well. So in this uh, New York Times bestseller book, it's called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, Patrick Lencioni, he, he looked at how a newly appointed CEO grew with the board and turned the company around. And, uh, and, and by the way, I really recommend this book. Uh, for, for those of you who know me, and if you're like me, you know how I dislike reading, so much so I, I subscribe to Audible and just listen to books as well. This is one of the rare books not only I read, but I finished reading. Uh, I have a lot of books that have stopped like about a quarter or a third. It's um, kind of how I read, I don't know. Anyway, super easy, good, easy to read but super re uh, relevant, relatable. It's quite easy to apply as well. So I highly recommend this book. But anyway, Patrick, he, he, he highlighted this, this framework that for a team who find themselves rarely meeting their target uh, with a goal um, or whatever, it is because that there was an inattention to, de to results. Inattention to results. That means... No one's really keeping an eye on the result we want to achieve. Uh, no one is focusing us back to the result. There's no really like a review or people to talk about the result. So there's the overall inattention to results that leads to a lack of result. You don't accomplish your goal. And he is saying that inattention to result, it is a result of an avoidance of accountability. Not holding others accountable not allowing others to hold you accountable. Sometimes it's simply by, you know, you can build an invisible wall to prevent topics of accountability to even happen. But more often, it's because there's no good measures to allow accountability to happen, or simply because you don't even know what the goal is to hold people accountable to what you want to achieve. And that's where uh, he says it's the avoidance of accountability is due to a lack of commitment. It is that in the end, the, the teams are not simply not committed uh, or owning up to the goals that have been set. If they don't commit to the goals that have been set, they will not hold each other accountable to those set of goals. In fact, if they don't even believe in the goals, they will not allow others to hold them accountable to that goal as well. So, and that leads to avoidance of accountability and, and, and inattention to results. So it goes on. So why is there a lack of commitment? He's saying it is, to, it is due to a fear of conflict. People are afraid to present their ideas, to be ripped apart and broken down into its element to find the good things about that idea. See, sometimes when you present the idea and when people don't like it, you can, it can feel like this is a personal attack because you love your idea. You get associated with it. And because it feels like an attack, you wouldn't want to raise against other people's ideas effectively because you're just, you know, uh, am I hurting that person? So the, there's a fear of conflict that is in the space and uh, because people are treating this as a personal issue and not just 
a matter, and there's a fear of that disagreement that goes along because it just feels uncomfortable. And he said the reason there's a fear of conflict is because there is a simple absence of trust. You don't trust one another. You haven't been through the trenches. You don't know their characteristics, their ambitions. What are they for? Is it a personal thing they're going after or are they about this team? When you don't know the person, you don't know how to approach the topic, you don't know how to talk about issues, and when there's no trust in a team, you can't have a healthy conflict. You hash things out and then commit to the goal that you all agree on because you set your peace so then you can hold each other accountable to what you committed on and pay attention to the result and see that happen. So it is a very simple and straightforward framework. And, uh, and it's so easy to apply into our lives uh, about this teamwork. And uh, so when, when I look at this, you know, we're talking about teamwork today. And I, I think we need to learn, really, first of all, from this historical team. All right, some, some of you, I know one of you here, know this as the best team in sport. What team? What team? Wildcats, that's right. You know, a valuable lesson we learned from high school musical is that you need to make sure you know which team you are on. You need to know which team you are on, and then you remind people which team. You can do fancy dance moves, you can do amazing vocals and musical, and just focus on the beautiful feature of Zac Efron and how young he is in this place. And just to remember that we are on the same team. In church, we are on the same team, and that's Team Jesus. We are on the same team, and we just have to remind ourselves. And I don't know how I can help you to remind you, but, you know, like, sometimes you just have to do a little challenge. I just, I just learn from Zach and be like, J-E-S-U-S, go team, Jesus, you know, whatever it is. Remind one another that we are on the same team, and it is Team Jesus. So once again... After a very long, unnecessary intro, uh, let's look at some case studies uh, from the Bible. Um, look at the wise approach uh, the first council made to resolve uh, an issue that happened, and then the interesting split that happened between Paul and Barnabas in their ministry together. So let's look at the first thing. Um, if you have your Bible, it's in, in the book of Acts. It's actually the whole chapter of chapter 15. I'm just going to pick a few things so you can look at it for a context. But if you've, if you've read the book of Acts, it is really a history book um, that documented how this news about Jesus and how the transforming power of this news was spread all across Europe. And then the, how the church expanded throughout this, these places. And in this early stage of expansion, uh, the Bible recorded in chapter 15 a, a conflict an issue, uh, a disagreement that happened. And it all started in verse 1 and with the statement that someone said, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Well, it's a very clear and strict statement. They are very clear about what they are saying. So when these uh, Jewish Christians uh, made this statement, Paul and Barnabas, there is a like, Nah, th th this is not right. It is not about circumcision or not. So they disagree so strongly. They had a conflict and debate with the believers who were trying to teach this. So after a bit of a kerfuffle, they were sent, sent by the church to Jerusalem, to the HQ, uh, to clarify the issue. Uh, so in, in verse 6, it says, The apostles and the elders met together to consider this, this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and Peter addressed them. And, uh, and then looking later on in verse 12, uh, we say, you see, the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Paul and Barnabas telling them about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. And then it says in verse 13, when they finished, James spoke up, brothers, he said, listen to me. So after all the big guns had their turn in, the, in this uh, meeting uh, to, to talk their peace, they come up with a plan. They came up with some goals, and they revealed it to the church. 
and uh, they continue to say, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. You know, the, the, the goal is not to make it difficult for people to turn to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to. So they went on and said, you know, the, the issue, this is how we're going to address it, but you should still keep certain things. And uh, that's what the letter was about. So that was the first council, the first ever Christian council. There's other councils that has been held since then, but that was the first council. Why did it work so well and so effective? First of all, they trusted each other. They trusted each other, and and more specifically, they, they trusted each other's loyalty and faithfulness in God and to God. Right, the ones that we saw uh, speaking, that they, they, they trust each other. They trust the leaders who have spoken. And of the names, you know, the, the Peter, James, Paul, Barnabas, these people have given so much of their lives to Jesus that it is evident. So they can trust who they are in Christ and who Jesus is to them. I mean, Peter was the first of the apostle to stand up and to preach to the crowd that saw 3,000 people believe, repented, and started the first church in Jerusalem. And this first church in Jerusalem was actually led not by Peter, but by James. And James is the, the half-brother of Jesus, who used to not really believe in who Jesus is, and you can read it in his book, but then come to know that this my brother is who he said is. So he has a very, he has this, I guess, mana in the, in, the, in the first church of who he is. And he was the leader of the church. And uh, even Barnabas, Barnabas was known by the Christians in Jerusalem. Uh, he was known um, to be the one who sold his positions to share with the believers in need. And we can read that in Acts chapter 4. Uh, for instance, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. I don't know whether you guys know this, but news flash. Barnabas is not called Barnabas. His name is actually Joseph. But you know how cool a guy is when his nickname is more famous than his name. The apostle gave him his nickname and he just ran with it. So Barnabas was fairly well known uh, among the circle as well. In fact, So much so, Paul, at this time of the council, Paul was the new kid on the block. All right, so that's why he he had to kind of gave his introduction, kind of gave his CV, really, that when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and apostle elders to whom they, Paul and Barnabas, reported everything God had done through them. So because of their reputation, because of the work they have already shown, accomplished, and seen, their trust towards one another came easily and immediately. They can be able to say, these guys are seriously about Christ, his gospel, and everything about him because they know who they are in Christ and they can see who each other is in Christ and who Christ is in their lives as well. And so because of that, you know, trust was built easily among this group. And when there's a strong foundation of trust in one another, And in God, in this case, they were able to really discuss the matter, have a really open, healthy, can be heated conflict, but they can trust each other where they're from and know that they're dealing with a matter, not the personal pe- issues and the, what they each, like kind of a personal uh, attack kind of thing. It's a matter. They can come in together and just really hash out this issue. And, um, and they had to because circumcision is really a, ve- is a very sensitive and touchy subject because circumcision is a pillar culturally for the Jews. But it is just a pillar culturally. It is not a requirement uh, for salvation or anything. And uh, I believe all the guys here who are Christians will say amen to that. So we see how they actually took turns. They, there was a very healthy and ongoing dialogue that, that was happening, that they took turns, they listened carefully to hear the reasoning and the heart behind each person. And uh, most likely not uh, document the detail in detail, they would discuss. 
they would clarify what do you mean by this? So what is important in this faith? What is important to salvation? What is not important to salvation? And they would talk it out more in detail so that they can come together with a plan and say, this is how we will address the public and other churches by writing a letter to them. And although it might not seem much as you read through Acts chapter 15 and that, this will be, would be a huge topic of conflict. Uh, actually, Paul, before he got to the council, he wrote in his letter uh, to the Galatians, speaking of uh, the disagreement he had with like Peter about how he treat Jews and Gentiles differently and all that, cultural things was a huge deal for them in the, the early Christians. So it would have been heated, it would have been pretty crazy about there. It would definitely be worse than a discussion you would have your Kiwi friends about why they should take their shoes off before entering your house. Because this is a deep-rooted cultural issue that they're talking about. It challenges their cultural identity. But they were able to do it. And because they were able to hash it out clearly and completely, they were able to form and commit to the goals that they set out. Uh, and that's why uh, James said, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. There is a clear objective, a clear goal that they try to accomplish. They were able to commit and say, yes, our cultural identity is important, but turning to God supersedes that. They're able to commit to it and say, yes, the church started in Jerusalem with the Jews, but it was not meant to stop there. They're able to commit to the common goals and say, yes, the non-Jews do not need to obey circumcision, but food sacrificed to idol is still a big no-no because that kind of idea was still a cultural and spiritual issue with the Gentiles in those times as well. So they made specifically a comment about it to understand the spiritual um, kind of consequences with that. So, 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 so they, they hashed it out, they come off the list, and they were able to commit to it because it was clear. And because they were able to commit to it, uh, they were able to hold each other accountable. And we actually don't read too much of them holding each other accountable to what they have committed to. But we can kind of um, guess, kind of have an educated extrapolation because we see how Paul and Barnabas were holding other believers accountable to this topic before the council, how this all, whole disagreement first started because certain people came down from Judea and, and to Antioch and were teaching the believers uh, this thing about circumcision. And uh, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. And they were appointed with other believers to go up to Jerusalem and to talk about this question. So if Paul and Barnabas can have an intense debate and dispute to hold people accountable to the right thing that they believe is in God, that end up that thing is confirmed to be the right thing through the council, you can guarantee that they will continue this method by holding people accountable to what is right. And when people do that, it is because they are committed to the goal that they have set out to do. And um, so there's little doubt that they will continue to do so. And as a result, um, the result is quite clear as we read the Bible, is that the gospel spread all across Europe. They were able to focus on what is important as a church, as Christians, and it went through to Jews, to non-Jews, all across Europe. And we, in fact, we see how the scripture was passed down and is then made available through our own modern history, and Christians can continue the same mission, be about the same goal over the last 2,000 years. And that is what happens uh, very clearly when, when the right framework is executed for team to function and achieve their goal. And we can see that very clearly and effectively with the first council. But let's look at something a bit different. Let's come back uh, to Acts chapter 15. You see, after this great win to clarify goals to, uh, that they can commit to in the first council, this super powerful dynamic duo, Paul and Barnabas, they actually disbanded and partnered up with their own crew. 
uh, so sometime later, uh, Paul said to Barnabas, you know, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. And I'm starting from verse uh, 37 here. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it was wise uh, to take him because Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and left. Commanded by the believers through grace of the Lord, he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So they split. They had a disagreement, they had a conflict, and they split. Now what happened? You know, why? Sometimes we think, you know, why can't Christians ever resolve their differences and just keep working together? Why did this have to happen well let's go through the framework again do they still trust each other do they still trust who they are in christ and who christ is in their lives do they still trust each other their intention their characteristic their integrity and all these kind of things i think the answer is very obvious yes they 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 do they do. I mean, they've gone through so much together. They know each other, all the trips together. They have such long history together. In fact, we know they still trust each other because they initially agreed on what to do in this trip, that we're going to go back again, go through the rounds, go to our tours, and, uh, and strengthen them, encourage them, and do all that kind of thing. So they, they do trust each other, and we can give that a big fat tick, that yes, they do. They trust each other. So Let's look at the conflict. The conflict happened not because of what to do, but how to do it, or more specifically, who to bring on for this mission. Barnabas wanted to take John or, or Mark, uh, and we know from Colossians, the book of Colossians in the Bible, that Mark is actually the cousin of Barnabas. So Mar uh, Barnabas wants to take him. But, but Paul didn't trust Mark because Mark bailed on him midway through the last trip. And Paul isn't willing to go through tough journeys, and mission trips back then are super tough. He wasn't willing to go through a tough journey with someone he can't trust to have his back. So that's why he said, I don't think it's wise to take someone we can't trust because we need everyone we can trust on this team. Uh, so Paul had his reason, and, um, and, and Barnabas obviously had his reason, which we'll look into it. So they actually had a good productive and focused conflict it's open it's genuine they could bring things on the board they can be harsh about it paul was feeling okay to say i know he's your cousin but come on man like can we really trust him so it is an open healthy conflict that they are going on but it's nonetheless a conflict that resulted them going into separate ways taking different people after a sharp disagreement they couldn't commit together because they are committed to different goals right paul's goal has always has always been to take the gospel to the gentiles towards europe and all these kind of things but let's look at barnabas what was his reason what is barnabas goal here it's not clear but if you look at the life of barnabas as a whole if we go through the bible to look at it Barnabas' ministry is very obvious because he was nicknamed that. It is the ministry of encouragement. He was nicknamed that, uh, and we see at Acts 4, he initiated the sharing of common good by doing it himself, selling his position, and by his action, he actually encouraged the church to also do it together. That's what he does. Barnabas encourages people. In fact, we continue to look at his life when he entered Antioch. So news about what's happening in the church called Antioch uh, re uh, received, um, came to the church in Jerusalem. So they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When Barnabas arrived, he saw that the, what the grace of God had done, Barnabas was glad and what? Encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man for this Holy Spirit and faith and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. So, so you see Barnabas... His gift and encouragement 
was so instrumental that through him encouraging and using his, his gifts effectively, people were brought to the Lord. And perhaps when Paul was writing in Romans of saying like, you know, if your gift is encouraging, you know, go and encourage. Perhaps he's thinking about Barnabas and seeing how effective that gift can be. So Barnabas was true to his gift, but perhaps he knew his own limitation when it comes to teaching um, the, the Word of God that is important for the next phase of the believer's growth. That's why he went and find Paul. He encouraged Paul by believing in Paul and who God called Paul to be, an apostle to Gentiles. Barnabas was the one that gave Paul his first gig. What an encouragement that is. Paul's first opportunity to ministry was given by Barnabas, which kickstart his ministry, public ministry altogether. I mean, just think about this for a second. Not Peter, not John, not James, all the big names, or even Ananias, who Paul met personally in his conversion, but Barnabas. So, so when, we, when we look at Barnabas and his whole body of work together, his whole ministry together, it is no wonder he would want to give his cousin a second chance to encourage him and pick him up where he had fell early on because that's Barnabas being true to who he is in the gift God has given him. And Paul wasn't wrong either. For what Paul was planning to do in the mission trips, he needed someone committed that he know he can trust. Someone like Silas that he took on. Because in that trip, when they got to Philippi, they were both thrown into prison together. And Silas, with Paul, had the faith and courage to sing praise and pray together inside the prison. That's who Paul needed. So all their goals were good and right. In 2 Timothy, Paul wrote this, Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I don't know whether, so the thing about 2 Timothy is that this is the very last letter Paul had ever written. And he wrote it to Timothy because Timothy was a spiritual son. And from the Bible, we can see he has a very close relationship with Timothy. He loved Timothy. He really brought him up, discipled him, mentored him. There has this like father-son relationship that's going on. So, in fact, if you look at 2 Timothy, it's just a, such a heartfelt, like, personal, intimate letter to Timothy. And uh, so this is Paul's very last letter. And after this letter, Paul was actually executed publicly. Uh, and making this his very last letter. And chapter 4 is, to, is really the end of the letter as well. And I just really love how everything comes around. See, Paul mentioned Mark, who ended up being helpful to Paul in his ministry. The ministry of Barnabas bore fruit to the ministry of Paul. See, Mark, who left Paul high and dry early on in his ministry, was actually one of the few that was named and acknowledged at the end of Paul's ministry. The one that deserted him, that betrayed him, that he couldn't trust, became the one that was helpful to him in his ministry. And it is because that Barnabas was able to live up to his own calling, his purpose from God, his goal. And it is okay to go separate ways for God. We are all called differently. There are times that we're called on the same thing, but there will be times that we're called to different things. And it is okay to go separate ways for the kingdom of God. And that's the great thing about Christian co-working and teamwork, is that there are so many things we can mutually come together for and so many things we could joyfully go on separate ways for as well. In the path of following God's purpose for us, our goal is simply to follow God. And, and this can happen in a very mutual and loving way because we are called by God first and we are loyal and faithful to God first and every relationship and partnership that actually comes in our life needs to come out of that priority loyalty to God first and then to our family 
and then to our ministry and then to our friends. It is God first. So the danger in our lives is to see what happened with Paul and Barnabas and just be like, it's okay. It's okay to go separate ways. But sometimes we do so not because out of loyalty to God. Sometimes we do so out of loyalty to ourselves, out of loyalty to the people we love and care, our families, which is super important, but can never be more important than our loyalty and faithfulness to God. Because that's how everything flows together. That's how trust is built. That's how conflict can happen healthily and openly and to commit accountable and to see result happen as well. And I wonder, like, when you, when, when you listen to this and when you think about it into your lives as well, what do you need to do? What do you need to do? Where is your focus? Whose team are you on? You know, if, if need to, if, if it really works, every week, I don't mind every, let's ECM, let's make a video and everyone just be like, J, E, you know, just make a chant so we can all remember, church, whose team are you on? If you're honest to yourself, whose team are you on? Whose team are you on? See, I find the, 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 the hardest thing always is the bottom ones. In fact, if you can get these two, and especially in church, if you can get these two right, I think the rest flows on not super smooth, but fairly much, much easier. Just get all the, all the non-crucial, essential, important things out of the way. Just trust and have good conflicts. And it is super hard because to trust it is speaking of a very vulnerable trust, a trust that you can open your lives to one another for them to see the deepest, darkest corners of your life, to be able to trust each other, have each other's back. You know, when Paul and Barnabas on mission trips, Paul and Silas on mission trips, it is months and years of living together, going through tough things together. And when things go tough, you know, all your nature comes out. You know, you're often most true to yourself when you're with your loved ones, your family, your partners and all these people because you're always together and good teamwork is allowing that space to come out knowing we're never perfect but we're here not to be perfect but to do something that we're called to do and if we can trust each other open ourselves up in a vulnerable way conflict is actually not that scary because you can trust them but the opening of ourselves is super hard because it feels very insecure. See, there's, there's this guy in the Bible. He had all the right position, resource, influence to make anything work, but he failed miserably. And that is King Saul, the first king of Israel. And if you, uh, no matter how you look at it, at the end of it, it is summed really well after you hear how much the people love and praise David. Saul became jealous over David. In the Bible, Saul became jealous over David. But why was Saul jealous? Saul was jealous because there's an insecurity in him that he never dealt with. That insecurity made him unable to celebrate the success of someone who actually adores and loves Saul and is serving Saul wholeheartedly. He can't get over that because there was an insecurity. But the reason he can't deal with his insecurity so that it became jealousy is because he wasn't willing to be vulnerable, not even to God and definitely not to one another. In fact, his jealousy was so great when he saw his son, Jonathan, was siding with David. He got so angry, he wanted to kill his own son. That is some serious insecurity that is happening. And I believe, I truly believe, insecurities needs to be confronted by being vulnerable there's only one simple direct way to deal with insecurity be vulnerable allow yourself open yourself to the right people of god with integrity love and care and allow yourself to be vulnerable for them for them to guide you help you and to lead you because if you can't even do it with other people that you should be able to trust. You will never be able to do it truthfully with God that you can't see. 
And it's only when we open ourselves through being vulnerable, we can then learn through the encouragement of the brothers and sisters around us and through the encountering of God that happens through that process because insecurity takes a long time to resolve. It often re, uh, is, uh, it lies in family, your upbringing, your, your family of origin. It's a very messy thing. I mean, if you look at Saul, when he says, like, who, who am I? You know, I'm, I'm from the smallest clan of the smallest tribe of the smallest family. I'm like the youngest one. He had a deep insecurity growing up. And we all have something. But the moment we allow ourselves to be vulnerable in a godly way, we come to learn to be secure because we can see how securely God is holding us in His hand. How much He treasures us. How much He sees us as His son and daughter, His children. And when we, are, we know we're secure in Christ, we can be secure. Because you realize that it's really not about me, what I can do, what I have. It is about what God has, who God is, and who I am in Him. And you're no longer as bothered at, with your insufficiency and adequacy because we all have. No one is perfect. You know, the Instagram culture is, show, is just putting inside our mind that everyone is perfect. Oh, perfect life, perfect this, that person is so good at that. Yeah, that person might be really good at it, but you just don't know what a, how crap they are in other things because they're just not showing on your stories. And, and sometimes you just have to realize everyone has their issues. You know, don't get overwhelmed by how perfect people are. Just be overwhelmed by how perfect God is. So I want to encourage all of us, you know, think about how do I foster trust in a way it is to the right people so that we can accomplish the right thing? How can I allow myself to be vulnerable to God and to the people of God who I know to love and care for me, that I know their character, character and integrity can be trusted and be on that process to deal with our insecurities? Because this willingness to do so, it is actually a willingness to mature. And when you mature by fighting the insecurities with vulnerability, it puts you in a place and prepares you to then be able to work with one another. And that allows you to then actually to build each other up, to edify one another the way a church, a body of Christ should be. And all through that process, it empowers us to fulfill the mission that God has for us, to be released to do God's thing, the way Barnabas can be released because he knows who he is in Christ and who God has for him. And he can do it with any team because he is secure. Same with Paul. And there's so many in the history of church that has always been happening. And it all starts with a vulnerable trust with one another. So, yeah, I guess I just, church, I really want to encourage you just to be honest, just to be open about the, the toughest thing that you struggle with and with your insecurity. And, um, and then, you know, maybe one day we can talk more about conflict because, you know, most of us as Asians, we hate conflict. <laughs> and we run away from it. Our, our family models just how to master to never to have conflict. You know, it's just, you know, everyone play the Tai Chi and just put everything under the cup, carpet. You know, we all know that. But conflict is actually so useful and crucial if we actually want to get the right stuff done rather than just, you know, focus on our, our face, our means, and all these kind of things. And um, you know, so I pray. I pray that you, you receive something from this, that this will be helpful in your work. This will be helpful in your spheres of relationship. This will ultimately be helpful in your pursuit for the mission and the kingdom of God that you felt drawn to and called to, that you can work with other brothers and sisters, establish trust immediately and effectively because we all know who we are in Christ and who Christ is in our lives as well. Let us pray. So Lord, I just really thank you for this place. I just really thank you for the people here. And I just really thank you for the stage in life that we are in just to be working and starting in that space and just to be wanting to do things the right way and having been consumed and disheartened 
by the consistent wrong things people always choose to do it. So Lord, I just pray that with the with this framework and the right attitude that you're building into our lives, that we will bring in something different into the world that you have called us with. That when we insist on what is right and what is of God that is effective and is fruitful, people will be amazed by just how amazing this book, this Bible is that can teach us so, so much about life because you are real, you are true, you are the creator and you created us knowing as human beings how we are to function most effectively. You have the manual of life that is the Holy Bible for us to teach us to be the best human being possible. So Lord, I just, I, I really sense like there's just this this confidence that's stirring up in this place to be more confident to do the right things in the right way, do the God things in the God way as well. So God, I just pray that you just release us and you just free us up to face our insecurities, to deal with it vulnerably to one another and understand that this maturity is for the purpose of building one another and for the goal of accomplishing the mission God has for every single one of us individually and collectively as a church, a body of Christ. So be with us, Lord. I just pray that you anoint many, many here with the gift of leadership. And I just pray that you just open our hearts to accept and be willing to use effective conflict management in our lives so that it is a helpful and useful tool as well. And we just thank you, Lord. And God, I just want to say, God, Lord, just how much we need you, Lord. That Jesus, we, we, we need you because dealing with insecurities is a very insecure thing. And I feel like some of you have been you've just been running away from that a bit. And uh, actually, many of you, you've been peeking at the window of your insecurity and be like, oh man, you're still there? But you want to do something about it. So Lord, I pray that as we draw close to you, speak to us, reveal to us, so that we know our first step to deal with that insecurity so that we can then go on to deal with that insecurity and then that insecurity and then that insecurity so that all together we find ourselves secure in you. Lord, help us. We need you, Lord. We can't do it without you. Be with us, your prison, your word, your power. Thank you, Jesus. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.